We gather to bring glory to God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, who was and is and is to come. And we do it among friends. A warm welcome to our service this morning as we praise God and sing his glory. So let's begin. We're going to begin with a song, which is the splendor of a king robed in majesty. And our singers are going to lead us in this. Let's pray together, shall we? We come, Lord, because you are great. We come to worship your name, you who were before all things, Alpha and Omega, there before the world was created, and there after all is gone. For you made us, and you shaped us, and you created everything that there is. You hold it in your hands. It is only in being, because you will it to be. All that we are afraid of, all that we worry about, all that we do not know is known and held by you. And yet, Lord, we come today because not only are you a great God and a holy God, not only are you a righteous God and a good God, but you are also the God who knows us 
knows our faults and our feelings, our sins and our brokenness. And yet you love us entirely. We come today lifting up the name of Jesus Christ, your son who came that we might know you, that we might come into your presence. And we ask today that we wouldn't just have come to church, come to a service, come to meet with friends, as good as all these things are. But in this time, as we worship and hear your word, we would have a sense of being in your presence, of realizing your greatness, of being amazed again by your love, of being filled again with your spirit, of being reminded again of all that you have done for us in Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray as we say together, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. The kingdom is yours. I want to think a little bit about that, and we're going to do it by having a quiz. Does anyone like quizzes? A few folk like quizzes? Yeah, a whole lot of folk here like quizzes. That's good. We've actually got another quiz on Saturday night this week. We're going to have a quiz in the church hall. And we're going to do that to raise money for Tear Fund. And you're also going to be able to get curry or macaroni right, from our catering group. So if you haven't already booked up, there's only, there's only a certain number of, of places, then please email Helen in the office and book up for that. That's on Saturday night. But we're going to do a quiz just now. To warm you up. And it's called the King's Quiz. To find out how much we know about kings, it's quite simple. I'm going to show you a king, and you have to tell me what king it is. So here's the first one. Anyone know which king that is? That's right, King Henry VIII. And do you know what his wife's name was? No, that's, that's too long a question, isn't it? That was a bonus question, if you know all his wife's names. But yeah, King Henry VIII, don't mess with him or he'll have your, your head off. Next king. No. A few folks don't know, you're scratching your heads. Does anyone know the name of that king or what? Where's he from? Yep. Shouting out about yep. He's from Shrek, that's right, yes. Does anyone know for a bonus point what his name is? That's right, King Harold. Yeah, King Harold or Harold. Yes, the king from Shrek. And his daughter is, of course, Princess Fiona. That's right. Okay, here's another king. See, we know who this king is. Hmm. Not technically called a king, but close enough. Yeah. Somebody, anyone that's not answered yet, do you know? No? Right, okay. Tutankhamun, that's right. And he's not a king, he's a, a pharaoh, yeah, but it's a sort of king, yeah. So Tutankhamun, who lived thousands of years ago in Egypt. What about another king? Now, does anyone know what film that's from? It's from The Lion King, that's right. And what's the king's name? Mufasa. Mufasa, yeah. I wasn't sure if it was Mufasa or it was Simba grown up. But I think it's Mufasa who is... Sorry? Oh, we've got a Lion King expert at the back there. It is apparently Simba. But yes, father and son that were kings. What about another king then? We're in Disney again. Yeah, anyone know? Or what film it's from? Anyone not answered? Back there? It's from, yeah, it's from, it, Ariel is, yeah, that's the right film. Because it is from The Little Mermaid. So you're right. But what's the king's name? Triton, isn't it? Triton or Trident? Triton, I think. 
Don't know. Yeah, we'll check that one later. I'll check, we could check with the Disney expert at the back. <laughs> right, okay, yes. It's King Triton from The Little Mermaid. Um, let's try another one. Not Disney this time. Not America. A little bit closer to home. That's his statue, which you can see in Stirling Castle, I think. Does anyone know? It's not William Wallace. You're close in the right area. But it is... It's Robert the Bruce. King Robert the Bruce of Scotland. Yes. Let's see if we've got any more kings. What about that one? Now, he's got a sword. And he's... Uh, to get the sword out. Which king is it? Anyone know? You know, it is King Arthur, yes, who was king of, well, England or Wales or Scotland or something. Nobody quite knows. But yes, the famous King Arthur with his sword, Excalibur. Okay, we've got any more kings. Let's see. Now, this is from a Disney film again, although it's based on a true king. Does anyone know? Who's, who's not answered? I'm getting the same quote. All the time. Somebody know Anthony, you, you know who it is? No, it's not King Arthur. Do you know? No, not King Arthur. I've got all the, all the experts over here on the kings. So who's not answered? Anyone not answered yet? Back. It's from Robin Hood, yes, but it's King King John. That's right. Supposedly the worst king there ever was. Before Donald, no, I didn't say that. Um, yes, King John, and that's from Disney's Robin Hood. Now, here's one which might need the adults to answer if anyone knows. Now, anyone know what king this is? A real king. There's a clue if you know your flags. Do you know who it is? It is the King of Spain. Well done. And it's a Spanish flag in the background. Does anyone know the King of Spain's name? Does anyone know the King of Spain's name? Felipe, yes. Yes, and double bonus points if you know that it's King Felipe VI. But there we have King Philip of Spain. Yep, a real king. I, I'm cheating now, am I? Who's that? Of course it's... This shared. All right. King Kong, yes. The king of the jungle. Or. Burger King, yes. Lunch. There you have it. From a nursery rhyme. Oh, King Cole. He was a merry old soul, wasn't he? A merry old soul was he. Right, and there's a king. Yeah, anyone know who that is? It's Elvis Presley, the king, that's right. Or we've got, this is an easy one, the king of, king of hearts, yeah. And I think we're reaching the end now. Oh, there's a king for the Lion, the Witch, and the Wardle. What's the king called there? Another Lion King, Yeah. Aslan from the line, the witch in the wardrobe. And I think at that point we are almost at the end. Does anyone know which king that is? It's George VI. Now, he was the last king that we had in this country. But let's stop for a minute there and ask this question. We have a monarch today in this country. We have a queen, not a king. Has anyone here met the queen? Or been at a garden party where the Queen's been there? Yeah. And if you're going to meet the Queen, how does it feel? Do you have to put on a posh hat? A posh hat? You wore a posh hat as well, well Alec, did you? Gloves, yes. You have to dress up really smart and meet the Queen and all the rest of it. And it, How many folk would like to meet the Queen? 
Yeah, quite a lot of folk would like to meet the Queen. It'd be a big day out, get nice food, canopies, and all those things. But I was just thinking about this. You think about meeting a king or a queen. Now, if you actually went and met our queen, it might be a bit scary that you might get things wrong or say the wrong thing, but I don't think she's very frightening, is she? Does she look very scary? I think and I wonder that if you were to meet not that queen in the palace, but you were to meet Henry VIII, I think that would be a bit more frightening, wouldn't it? If you met a real powerful king who could send people to prison or cut off their heads or pass a law or all of these things that are really, really powerful. And sometimes we think of kings, we think of cartoon characters, or we think of constitutional monarchs and people that are important and we like them, but they don't really have an awful lot of power. But actually, when the Bible talks about kings, it's talking about people like Pharaoh or the emperor or the kings of Babylon or really powerful people. And therefore, when the Bible says that God is like a king, it's reminding us that God is very powerful, that God rules over all the kings and all the lands and all the laws and all of the things in all of the world today. But the good news for us as Christians is that we can come into the presence of God, the king of everything. But we do it knowing of his love for us in Jesus, who he made king over all things. And we do it knowing how much he gave for us. So we don't need to come laughing as if the king didn't matter. and It was just a cartoon character. And we don't need to come frightened as if it was Henry VIII who might cut our heads off. But we come and we worship and we do it from our hearts. Because we know that this king, this lord that we worship in church is all powerful and yet loves us so, so much. We're going to sing a song just now about that. And Lord, I lift your name on high as if we're coming into the presence of God the King and we're saying you are the one that we love and we worship and we revere. But at the same time, we're saying we are so glad that in Jesus, you're in our lives, that you sent him because of his love for us. So let's sing together this song. There's actions. You know them? You'll pick them up. I lift your name on high Lord, I love to sing your praises I'm so glad you're in my life I'm so glad you came to save us You came from heaven to earth To show the way From the earth to the cross to the grave, from the grave to the sky, Lord, I lift your name on high. Lord, I lift your name on high. Lord, I love to sing your praises. I'm so glad you're in From the earth to the cross, my debt to pay. From the cross to the grave, from the grave to the sky. Lord, I lift your name on high. Lord, I lift your name on high. Lord, I love to sing your praises. From heaven to earth to show the way From the earth to the cross My dead to pay From the 
cross to the grave, from the grave to the sky. Lord, I lift your name on high. And now the Sunday school are going to go out for their own worship and activity. In September and October, we spent a few weeks on the beginning of the Bible, reading the first four chapters of the book of Genesis. And I thought as we move towards Advent, we might go to the end of the Bible and spend three or four weeks just looking at the last book, the book of Revelation. Uh, I said that to someone this morning, and said, oh, that's a bit scary. Um, but God's Word is always a bit scary because it takes us to new places and shows us new vistas. Let's come and hear the word of the Lord. We're going to read from the book of Revelation from the first chapter and the first 18 verses. The revelation from Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants what must soon take place. He made it known by sending his angel to his servant John, who testifies to everything he saw that is the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy, and blessed are those who hear it and take it to heart what is written in it, because the time is near. John, to the seven churches in the province of Asia, grace and peace to you from him who is and who was and who is to come, and from the seven spirits before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, and the ruler of the kings of the earth. To him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood, and has made us to be a kingdom of priests to serve his God and Father, to him be glory and power forever and ever. Amen. Look, he is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him, and all the peoples of the earth will mourn because of him. So shall it be. Amen. I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is and who was and who is to come. I, John, your brother and, and companion in the sufferings and the kingdom and patient endurance that are ours in Jesus was on the island of Patmos because of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. On the Lord's day, I was in the spirit and I heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet which said, write on a scroll what you see and send it to the seven churches, to Ephesus and Smyrna and Pergamon and Thyatira and Sardis and Philadelphia and Laodicea. I turned around to see the voice that was speaking to me. And when I turned, I saw seven golden lampstands. And among the lampstands was someone like a son of man, dressed in a robe, reaching down to his feet, and with a golden sash around his chest. The hair on his head was like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were like blazing fire. His feet were like bronze, glowing in a furnace. His voice was like the sound of rushing waters. In his right hand, he held seven stars, and coming out of his mouth was a sharp, double-edged sword. His face was like the sun shining in all its brilliance. When I saw him, I fell at his feet, though dead. Then he placed his right hand on me and said, Do not be afraid. 
I am the first and the last. I am the living one. I was dead, and now look, I am alive forever and ever. I hold the keys of death and Hades. Amen. Thanks be to God for his word. Let's pray. Father, we come to this amazing and perplexing vision that you gave through the Lord Jesus Christ to your servant John. And we come reading it afresh and asking that as we grapple with your word this morning, that you indeed would speak to us and give us a vision of yourself. Amen. This is the end of the year. That might strike you as a little bit strange when I say that because you think, well, it's only in November. How can it be the end of the year? But it is actually the end of the year because next Sunday is the first Sunday in Advent. We'll have the the candles and we will begin the countdown to Christmas. But the first Sunday in Advent is actually in a liturgical Christian year, the first Sunday of the year. All the orders of service books start on the first Sunday of Advent and then they run right through to this Sunday, which is the last Sunday of the Christmas Christian year. So the year is now at an end before it starts. The secular year obviously starts in January, just like the tax year starts in April, and the Christian year starts with Advent, starts with that sense of waiting on Jesus, that sense both of remembering that people waited back when Jesus came the first time, but also with a sense of the church today waiting on the Lord's return, and we'll speak more about that next year, next week rather. One of the things that this idea of a, of a church year does for us, or a Christian year, is it reminds us that all our time as Christians is marked out by Jesus. Jesus changes our entire lived reality. And sometimes we miss that. I mean, we miss it when we think about time itself. What year is this? This is the year 2021, isn't it? But actually, in What's the reference for that date? And it is that it is 2021 AD, the year of our Lord, 2021. Our very calendar is marked out by the Lord's coming at Christmas. And our belief as Christians is that the years go on, history unfolds, it is all ending, it is all coming to the Lord returning at the end of time itself when we stop numbering the years, whether that be in a few years' time, or that be in a thousand years' time, doesn't matter. The whole thing is headed to a point. It's not just one damn thing after another, but it has a purpose and a meaning, and that meaning is Jesus. Now, in some Christian traditions, this particular Sunday, the last Sunday of the year, has become known as the Sunday of Christ the King, which is a really good place to stop the year, isn't it? Reminding ourselves that Jesus is the king, that whatever else happens, whatever else we're worried about, whatever else seems to be going on, we remember that Jesus rules over all things. He is the living one who once was dead, but now is alive and reigns forever and ever. He is the one that God the Father has given the kingdoms of the earth. He holds the keys of death and Hades. All of these things matter because they remind us that everything that we do, everything that we say, points to Jesus. When we come to worship on the Lord's day, or when we gather in prayer, or when we open the scriptures, we're not just doing a religious exercise. Sometimes we come to church and we think, well, will the music be good this morning? Will the preacher be entertaining? Will the the pew be comfortable? What will the heating level be? And all these other things. But actually to stop and remind ourselves that what we do in worship is we come and we lift up Jesus. We lift him up and we remind ourselves that he reigns over everything. We remind ourselves of this reality that the Bible proclaims. 
that he is the Lord of heaven and earth. And we are for that moment as we worship, not just singing a song we like because it makes us feel good, but we are being caught up in the very song of heaven itself, which proclaims glory to the Lamb who was slain. Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. And if you read through Revelation and you don't understand all the images, you can read it through and find in italics those bits that are songs of praise, reminding us of how great, how great, how great is our God. I, we sang that at the beginning of the service, and I, I don't know about you, but there's a little bit of me as we sung that great song, just thought, this is repetitive. It just keeps saying, God is great, God is great, God is great. But actually, that's what worship does. It keeps repeating itself that truth of the greatness and the holiness and the majesty of God until we begin to see it and we get to get caught up in it and we begin to align our lives with that truth. If you go into a Greek Orthodox church, there's quite often a dome or a painted ceiling and you will see on it an image right in the center of all the other biblical pictures of Christ on high. And they call that the Pantocrator. It literally means the one who reigns, who rules over everything. And the point of that is that as you come into that church and you begin to look at the artwork, you're lifted up and you are reminded who is in charge of the universe. Who is in charge of your life? Who is there and holds everything in being? Who gives meaning to everything that we do and we breathe and we think? And may our worship, even though we don't have images on the ceiling, do exactly that for us week by week by week. I'm going to be bold because I'm going to look at the book of Revelation for the next few weeks. And um, that might seem bold and brave or it might seem a bit stupid. Um, Particularly just in the first part of my ministry here, Martin Luther actually told preachers to avoid this book. He said, it'd be better just left alone. It's just, it'd almost be better if it wasn't in the Bible because it's just so hard. And it's a dangerous book because um, some of us maybe have started to read it at some point and we've got really confused by it because it's full of quite violent imagery. It's got seals being broken and trumpets being sounded and it's got dark beasts with demonic heads and armies and, and all sorts of dangerous things that are in it. But actually, Revelation, in all its confusion, points to one very simple truth that even a small child of faith can understand, and it's simply this. Jesus is victorious over everything. Absolutely everything. It points to his majesty and the completion of his victory on the cross. There is nothing left to fear. The book starts with the revelation from Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants what must soon take place. Now, the, the Greek word for revelation is the word apocalypse, which has come to many mean to us a big disaster, isn't it? The apocalyptic times or, or something awful going to happen. But actually, the word apocalypse or the word revelation simply means an unveiling. You know when you, you, you know, something is unveiled, there's a curtain and you tear back and you find out what's there. Or, or, or very shortly when we have the, the Advent um, calendars in our house and we will open the door and you will find behind it the little bit of plastic or the little bit of chocolate or whatever else it is that disappoints you. Because you thought it was going to be big. But that's what a revelation is. It's where the door is opened and you see what's behind it. And in a sense, in, in the Bible, when that word is used, it, it is almost as if what is happening is the stage curtain has been torn so that you see what's going on behind the scenes. You see what's really happening and not just what's appearing to happen. And so this book says a revelation from Jesus Christ allowing you to see what's happening. Jesus is going to show us what is going on. It can equally be translated a, re a revelation of Jesus Christ. So it's a bit ambiguous. Is Jesus the one that's tearing the curtain back or is Jesus the one that's behind the curtain when we tear it back? Uh, and the answer in Revelation is actually both. Jesus is showing us what the ultimate truth is, and the ultimate truth is his amazing victory. Now, Revelation, if you just read right through it, can be a very confusing book. 22 chapters with scrolls and seals and monsters and battles and dragons and all sorts of stuff. 
And it can be very hard to understand. And a lot of Christians have taken the book of Revelation and, and what they've done is they've said, well, this is all about how, how the world will end. So we need to work out what's going on. So if, if I read it this way and I, I think about it this way, I can see the battles of my own day. So people read it in wars and in, in, in Europe, in wars of religion, and they read it in Martin Luther's day and said, oh, this is all about what's going on in Europe today. Other people read it in centuries later and, and they, they, they saw their own time in it. They saw the communists and they saw the, the Russians and they saw all these different things in it. And you know what? Every single one of those predictions ended up being wrong. Every single one of them. So that maybe is a lesson to us. The revelation isn't about finding out what happens. It's much simpler than that. You know, if you're reading most books and you're trying to get the best out of them, maybe a mystery book, the advice is, Whatever you do, don't read the last page first. Have you done that? Read the last page of a book first? Or, or you've been halfway through the mystery and you've, you've read at the end to see who done it? I, I, and in one way it's great, but it spoils the book, doesn't it? It's not the way you're supposed to read it. But there is a sense when you come to the book of Revelation that it's okay to read the last page first. And in fact, the mystery will disappear if you do that, but that's a good thing because... Let me spoil it for you. Close your ears if you don't want a spoiler. We win. <laughs> or better, he wins. And there is a sense that that's the simple truth of Revelation as you read it, if you can grasp that. It doesn't matter what demons or what evils or what empires or what corruption or what disasters or whatever happens. It doesn't matter how much the Roman Empire or the Babylonian Empire or the Greek Empire or the Nazis or whatever evil regime comes along or corrupt governments or godless ages. It doesn't matter. Because in the end, Jesus Christ is utterly victorious and utterly trustworthy. Whatever happens to us and us, his people, will triumph through that. And we'll speak more about that in the coming weeks. But this vision is simply a vision of Jesus, a vision that transforms us. Verse 3 of what we read there said, Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy, and blessed are those who hear it and take to heart what is written. Now, blessed just means happy. When I read that at first, I thought, that's a little bit strange, because I, I think most people who start to read Revelation would not say blessed is the one who reads aloud. They'd actually say confused. Or despairing, or does your head in. But actually, what he is saying is, is quite simply, there is a real blessing, the understanding that we don't need to fear because Jesus Christ has overcome everything. There's maybe something practical there as well about how we approach Scripture. Read it aloud. One of the fears I, I have today with the Bible is we, we say we're committed to it, but I'm not going to ask you to raise your hands, but how many of us even open it through the week? Sometimes even people who are coming to church every week, the only time they hear the Bible is when it's read from the front and the preacher preaches it. Happy, says John, as those who read the Bible aloud, who read the Word of God aloud. And I, I would just challenge you if, you, if you're feeling that your spiritual life is going nowhere, read Scripture. I, I actually wouldn't say start with Revelation. Just read the Word of God aloud. Let it reassure you. Let it reorientate you to who you are. Let it sink in. Because if you do that, then you will find happiness in your Christian life. You will find contentment. You will find that the worries you have about whatever is happening begin to change, to be transformed by the promises of God. Keith Green, the musician who wrote There is a Redeemer, once said that there are three types of people in the world. There are people who are afraid. There are people who don't know enough to be afraid. And there are people who know their Bible. The reassurance that the Bible is giving to us. And that perhaps is shown most if we think about the background to the book of Revelation. John writes this. He's given this revelation. 
He is one of the followers of Jesus, one of the original 12. In fact, he's the last one. Because by the time John is receiving this, he's an old man. And all of the others, Peter, James, all the rest of them, they're dead. Most of them have been martyred, killed for their faith. And John himself finds himself in the last part of his life exiled to an island called Patmos. Patmos is off the coast of Turkey. Some people may have visited it. It's really in the middle of nowhere. And at that point, although the mission of the church has grown, the church is still very small. It's probably only a few thousand people scattered around the cities of the ancient world. But the might of the Roman Empire is beginning to hit down upon it, to persecute it, to hard press it. The fury of Rome, particularly among the time of the emperor Domitian, is beginning to hit the church as the emperors demand that all of their citizens worship them as gods. The church is beginning to feel under pressure. There's persecution coming. There's also pressure from families, from business, from employment to conform. Conform to this imperial cult. Toe the line. Caesar is Lord, not Jesus is Lord. And there is a temptation among many to give up. To take the easy way. To forget all about Jesus. And into that... John is given this vision of a Jesus lifted up who fills all things. A Jesus who is behind the curtain reigning over all things. An immense, huge vision of Jesus. These few small little groups of churches in these seven places in Asia worshipping a a, a God. And yet, here is John saying, this God in the Lord Jesus Christ rules and reigns over all of reality. Now, today for us, we are not being persecuted. Not always easy to be a Christian where we are, but we are not being persecuted. But yet, there are dark things that we are all facing every single day. It might be illness. It might be frailty. It might be family problems. It might be financial worries. It might be anxiety. It might be depression. It could be a hundred and one other things that we are facing that make it difficult to keep trusting, make it difficult to keep growing in Jesus. And the temptation, the temptation is sometimes to to, to give up our faith, or or it is to become one of those people who go to church and but but the whole Jesus thing, the enthusiasm for all of that just just vanishes till Christianity becomes a hobby. And here in the book of Revelation we are given again a picture of Jesus, a big Jesus, a Jesus worthy of worship, a Jesus who is reigning over all things. Just this last couple of days, Matthew Paris, the commentator, wrote in the Times an article. And in that article, he was criticizing the Archbishop of Canterbury who was talking about mission and the need to tell people about Jesus and they need to see conversions and they need to plant new churches in the Church of England. And he said, that's not what the Church of England's ever been about. The Church of England is just about people going to church and enjoying the music and feeling quite happy. They don't really believe in that God stuff. Now, he's actually got a point. Because it is very easy for churches to become just like that. Where our focus is on the church. Our focus is on the things that we are doing. The focus is on the music being right. And the focus is on the preacher being right. And the seats being right. And the heating being right. And all the things. Because we quite like church. But somehow what we have lost is a vision of the glory of God. The mission that we have been given to see the world transformed in the name of Jesus Christ. To see life safe from hell and death. To know that he's alive and reigning over all things. All of that's got squashed out. I remember looking at a newspaper and seeing the listing for church services for a certain church in Glasgow. I won't name which cathedral it was. I've been struck by the fact that In the advert, it said, the choir will sing the anthem and it will be in the key of. And I just, this image of people saying, will I go and worship God this morning? No, it's not in my key. Oh, I like it in the key of whatever it was. I'll go to church. As if it was all about that. 
What about saying, come and worship the living God who made heaven and earth, who is before all things, who is the Alpha and the Omega, who gave his life for the world. He'll come to church because the music's good. Uh, now, don't get me wrong, good music's great, and we should value it, and we do value it. I'm not knocking that. But what are we about? What are we about? He is, says this chapter, the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, the ruler of the kings of the earth. Faithful witness because Jesus shows us the way. He is the one who gave his life. He is the one who endured all the suffering and the scorn and the, the troubles of life, and yet he was faithful to the end. The firstborn from the dead, he rose from the dead, and in that is our hope and our promise. We don't speak about that very often. I'm, I'm very much struck that the only time that we really speak of our Christian hope of life beyond death is at funerals. But we need to proclaim it in all that we do, in all that we sing. And he is the ruler of the kings of the earth. He is the bigger than the politics, the system, the cultural problems, the environmental disasters, all the things that we face, as important as they are to come out with a Christian perspective, this idea of Jesus. And he goes on and on. Just read this chapter again. Jesus, the faithful witness, who has set us free from our sins. Freed us from our sins by his blood, it says there in verse 5. You know, that, that seems like big words, but, but, but let me just put it in, in these simple terms. Are you held back as a Christian because you feel like a failure? A spiritual failure? A moral failure? Not as good as some other Christians, not as spiritual, not as prayerful. Here it says, what Jesus has done is forgiven you. Let that release you. Let that set you free. Your failures do not define you. Jesus defines you. Jesus is all it is. He has given you a purpose. He has made you to be a kingdom, to be priests. You know, we, we say we're short of ministers right now in the church. But we believe in the priesthood of all believers. That means that Jesus has made every one of us a priest. All of us stand as people who can talk to the living God and relate him to the world. That's what we're about. That's our purpose. A huge, big, glorious God. Jesus loves us, rules us, frees us, defines us. This is so important. You know, I'm, I'm very much aware just now that there's become this, this very trendy um, phrase where politicians talk about faith communities. You heard that expression? People of faith. And I sort of get why politicians do that, because they're, they're wanting to refer to all religions. They're trying to find an inoffensive term to do that that, that defines the, the rights and the privileges that we should have. My problem with it is when Christians start to use that language. People of faith. Communities of faith. As if we were defined by our religiosity, or we were defined by something we did or, or, or who we were. We're defined by Jesus. We are his community. We are people of Jesus, not of something we have done. Or He is the object of our worship. We're not here because we've got faith. We're here because Jesus triumphed over heaven and hell and life and death and reigns over all things. At least that's why I'm here. I don't know about you. John gives us this remarkable vision. He's coming with the clouds. He is the Alpha and the Omega. We could go on and on. And then he says in verse 17, I fell at his feet as if dead. He is the first and the last. There's just two things to, to, to consider here very briefly. One is this. John was a Jew. And the one thing in the ancient world that defined Jews was they only believed in one God. They wouldn't worship anything else other than the one God, the God of the Bible, the God of Abraham and Isaac. Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord is one. Now, Romans and Greeks didn't have a problem because they had lots of spiritual beings and heroes and gods and pantheons of gods and Zeus and Athena and 
Jupiter and Mars and all the spirits of whatever it was. And they could add another God. That wasn't a problem. But for Jews, you worshipped only God. Anything else was idolatry. You didn't make images of him. You didn't have bits of him. You didn't worship angels, anything like that. And here is John saying, that God is the Alpha and the Omega, but this Jesus that we have come to know, he is the beginning and the end. And here is that John worshipping Jesus. Now, this is the remarkable transformation of the early church. As they experienced Jesus, they said, there is only one God, but he is God. And it wasn't something they developed over time or anything else. They couldn't explain it to start with. But right from the start, the early Christians worshipped Jesus. They recognized that this one God was somehow also in Jesus Christ. That's the first thing to note. The second thing to remember is this. John was a disciple. He spent three years with Jesus. He knew him very well. In fact, in the Gospel of John, it it, it describes John as the disciple whom Jesus loved. It's a lovely sign of that intimate relationship. He was my best pal. And I just knew you loved me. You get that sense. And in fact, it's really quite intimate in in John's gospel, so much so we find it a bit strange because at the Last Supper, as they had that last meal together, John records that the the disciple whom Jesus loved, which was probably himself, was leaning against his chest. An intimate feature. And here is John saying, when I saw Jesus, And he reassured me in this vision that he was indeed alive after I'd seen him dead. I was there at the cross. I watched him die. This best friend, I worshipped him. I fell as if I was dead at his feet. And sometimes as Christians, we've got so familiar with God loves me, God's there for me, you know. I have a relationship with him. It's all quite approachable. But we need to remind you that this Jesus whom we have come to know and be familiar with, this Jesus who is my friend, is the Alpha and the Omega who made all things and through whom all things were created, who holds the seven stars in his hands and is there from the beginning to the end and is to be worshipped and glorified. And suddenly you see what we do in a church which sometimes feels so small and so petty is lifted up until we realize that we have this vision of reality in this Jesus that we know who is the Pantocrator ruling over all things. John, look at me, says Jesus in this vision. I am more powerful than you could ever imagine. And therefore, there is no need to fear. The Roman Empire in all its might, the most powerful empire that has ever existed, is nothing compared to me. I hold the keys of death and Hades. And if he holds the keys of death and Hades, he can be trusted to hold the keys to your house, your car, your life, your marriage, and your kids, and your finances, and your health, and everything else that concerns you. Look at me and see my power. Now, Revelation is not saying, look at Jesus and everything will be fine. It is not saying that. In fact, if you look at this in a purely political level, and you look at this from these little churches that are feeling the pressure of the Roman Empire, as they start to read through the book of Revelation, they will find it concerning, because it will show, as it reveals the curtain back, that whole sorts of evil powers are at work. It will show that there is even more persecution and suffering to come to God's people. The reassurance is not that everything will be well It is that Christ has triumphed over all things. And in the end, in the last page, in the last analysis, even if you die, even when you die, he has you. He has you in his hand. It's interesting. In Psalm 27, David is going through all sorts of difficult times. Persecutions and enemies and 
misunderstandings and wars and all sorts of stuff. And he begins to pray in that psalm. But he does not pray, oh Lord, make things better. Oh Lord, take away my sufferings. Oh Lord, make the people understand me. Oh Lord, have my back. He prays rather this. One thing I ask of you, Psalm 27 verse 4. One thing I ask from the Lord. One thing do I see. That I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life. And gaze on the beauty of the Lord. He's asking for the very thing that John was given in Revelation. May I see Jesus and see how great and big and powerful he is. You know, as a church, sometimes we just take our eyes off that. We do business meetings. We do plans. We scrutinize accounts. And all those things are important. But we forget that at the heart of it, we want to see the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ lifted up in our lives and in our community. And that changes everything. You know, I, I'm going to start from next week having a time of prayer um, in the hall, just the small hall next door, from 10 o'clock to 10.30. And if you can come for any part of that half hour, come. You don't need to pray out loud. But I want to do that because I want us to start to pray before the service. To pray not just that things will go nicely or smoothly, but to actually ask that the presence of the living God would be among us as we come around God's word. And if some of you can come and join me for that, that would be great, as many as possible. Because there is something about that. I found as I've preached over the years, as we've begun to pray just before the services, the mundane things, the preparation that I've done, the, the music and everything else, we suddenly have that sense of God's spirit within it. That this is really the worship of the living God that begins to transform our lives and our meanings. And there is something very practical in all of this as we begin to move into Advent. Do you like Christmas? Yeah? It, it can have its problems and its dark sides and its painful memories, can't it? But we like Christmas. And here's the reality, and this is where Matthew Paris, when he talked about you know, the church doesn't really do the God stuff, it just does the, the, the worship stuff, is, is sort of right. Because lots of people that don't believe in God quite like Christmas. In fact, lots of people that don't believe in God go to church at Christmas. Why? Because in the midst of a painful world, for a few moments, they find a little place where they can go and have that nostalgia and, and, and that sense of niceness and that sense of everything, just forget all my troubles just now and, 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 and be there. And there's nothing wrong with that. But it's small. And, and we know it's small because we sort of know even as we're going through it, if that's the level we approach Christmas, I, I like this and it's a bit of relief from the, the darkness of the winter and, and all that's sort of there. Then come January we'll be bold because that's over. What we've got next and we're booking a holiday because we need something else. To do. But if through the eyes of faith in the Lord Jesus Christ we approach Christmas a different if we say this is where the light shines in the darkness and it shall not be overcome. If this is where we say that God changed the world forever. If this is where we say that God sent his only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. If this is where we meet the Alpha and the Omega. If this is where we find the purpose of our life. If this is where we have a vision that rips back the curtain and shows us what's going on. Then we will be able to face January and February and March and April and May. We won't just need a Christmas carol to get us through it. But we will have a hymn of praise that comes from those Christmas carols right through the whole of the year itself. And so we come to Christmas not having to hide. And in fact, this year on the 12th in the evening, we'll have a special service where we invite folk to come and face some of the pain and the loss that they've experienced. We're going to find a way to light a safe candle so that we can come and say, yeah, Christmas can have its dark sides. We're still going to have the joy and the happiness and the children and all those things. That, that's great. God's given us that gift. But we have something that makes that even better. Something that that only points to. And that is the truth that we find in Jesus Christ, the King, the vision of reality. The one before whom we tremble and we worship. For he is the power and he is the love. And he has given himself for us. Amen. We're going to sing just now. We're going to sing part of Psalm 98.
come to pray and just a few announcements some of these I've made already one is just to remind that we're going to have prayer in the hall um, from 10 till 10 30 from next week if you can come along please do um, if you're come late that's okay you're not going to have to pray, pray out loud if you don't want to but just to gather and if you've got duties and need to leave early that'll be okay as well so please do join me the other thing we mentioned was a quiz next Saturday night um, I, sometimes these things people book up at the last minute but we would really ask you to come along if you can. We're going to be sitting in tables of six, but if you come as a single person or as a, a group of two, we'll put you into teams when you get there. You don't have to worry about that. The food is all set up, um, but we do need to know the numbers in advance. If you want to book for that, if you can email the office or phone the office and let Helen know, she'll record the numbers for that. But please do come along. It'd be good to see as many folk um, who feel safe coming out at this time. Um, on a sadder note, I have to announce the death of one of our, our members, Sadie McCaig. Um, our thoughts with her, her family at this time. The service to mark Sadie's life will be at Holy Town on the 1st of December at 11.30. And last week, we noted the death of Catherine Lilly. And just to announce, we didn't have the, the funeral time at that point. That will be on Friday, the 25th of November, here in the church at quarter to two. Let's pray together. Oh Lord, we come and we lift our hearts to you, the living God. We proclaim holy, holy, holy is the Lord, the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. We sing, worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive glory and honor and power. We ask by your Holy Spirit that in our worship today, you will have given us a vision of you. That we might glorify you. And so we pray, Lord, that not just our songs in this place today, but our living through the week, our minds and our hearts would be reorientated just as time itself is around you that we would know that you are the one that has forgiven us. You are the one who has made us priests. You are the one who has given us the kingdom. We serve and give witness to you, no matter how hard it may be, for you have overcome everything. Today, Lord, we would pray for your church, that it wouldn't just be an organization, it wouldn't just be another charity, but it would be filled with your glory. We pray as we try to reshape our life here in our church, as we try to do the mission that you've called us to, that right through the whole of the Church of Scotland and beyond, we would be asking the simple 
question of what bears witness to you and brings glory to your name. This week, Lord, we pray particularly for the work of, of Crossreach as it seeks to serve you. We thank you for its witness among some of those that are most needy at this time. We pray for its staff and those that lead it. But as we do that, Lord, we ask that you would save us from thinking that the work of the mission is for those that are paid or employed in church or in agency, but we would realize that you have given this to all of us to serve and glorify you. This week, Lord, take from us our fear. Our fear of the things that we suffer, our fear of the ordinary things. For you are both the King and Lord of the universe, but you are also the one who calls us by name, who loves us, who gave your life for us. So we pray today that you would fill us again with your spirit and enable us for service and for worship through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Let's close our service as we sing that great hymn of praise, crown him with many crowns, the Lamb upon the throne. and our hearts and our living. And may the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be yours this day and forever. Amen.